This is an aerial perspective of what a hammock is or a hummock. There's, there's three names for these islands that are surrounded by tidal marshlands or waterways. Hammocks, hummocks, and probably the best descriptor would be back barrier islands because they are indeed um, descendants of barrier island chains except for the ones that have been man-made uh, from dredge disposal or disposal of sediments from phosphate mining or other types of activities but by and large they're uh, quite old approximately the same age as all the barrier islands obviously they're, they're, many of them are a little bit older than the current barrier islands but not as old as are the sea islands uh, so this gives you an indication of that. The sea islands are oh, up to about a million years old. Uh, the barrier islands and marsh islands. Marsh islands are simply large blocks of marshland that are delineated by tidal waterways or sounds and bays. Many of our marsh islands have names. You've probably heard of Otter Island, St. Helens Sound. Well, that's a name for that entire large several thousand acre block of tidal marshland that's between the Ashku River, St. Helena Sound, and South Edisto River pretty much, or Fish Creek, except between Otter um, Island and Pine Island. So the individual hammocks or hummocks oftentimes do not have names. At least they're not names that, that I would be able to find by going to map resources. There may be local names for some of them, um, but generally they do not. So many marsh islands actually have uplands flying within them. Technically, any upland area that does not typically become inundated at high tide is a hammock. Many of the smaller hammocks and low elevation hammocks are colonized by just salt shrub type habitat like sea oxide daisy for instance, things like that as opposed to spart uh, smooth cord grass the spartana that's within the tidal marshlands. Um, so anyway, then we have uh, other islands that are within the mouths of sounds and bays that are much younger typically and more dynamic because uh, they're on the, the right in the um, target of wind and water. And then shell, shell rakes and sandbars, of course, are very dynamic, some very short-lived, and I've mentioned the ones that are man-made. So the number of islands within the coastal zone of South Carolina, the coastal zone is pretty much delineated on the west by US Highway 17. That's a pretty close approximation to the inland boundary of the coastal zone. Then, of course, the Atlantic Ocean is the um, outer boundary of the coastal zone. So there are 4,200, 4,300 islands. The islands that are, that are a thousand acres or larger are considered to be either sea islands or barrier islands. And the barrier islands are fronting the Atlantic Ocean. The sea islands are back within tidal marshlands and are abutting the mainland. So the distribution of hammocks, I'm going to call them hammocks just because that's what I've kind of settled upon. Uh, like I said, it's interchangeable. Uh, but uh, the, there are approximately 3,500, but islands less than like point, I think it was point 0.18 acres or 0 0.18 acres or something were not included in the inventory that was done by OCRM. They actually initiated the study of, of hammock islands because they were tasked with coming up with regulations for permits for bridges to islands. So they contracted with DNR to do this ecological study because up until that point no one had done any research in South Carolina on these islands. Um, so I was fortunate enough to, uh, I've been a fisheries biologist my entire tenure with DNR, but I've always had a broad interest and arguably knowledge in other things other than just fishes. So I was recruited in addition to my ongoing responsibilities working on fishes to run this initial project. But this is uh, the distribution by size. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't uh, inventory any islands less than 0 0.108 acres. So in fact, there are many thousands of additional hammocks to this 40, I mean 3,500 or so. So they're probably more like five or 6,000 islands within the coastal zone. But that's the distribution. You see the vast majority are, are in the smaller size and very few really large hammocks. And a number of attributes or assets for these islands. Uh, the thing that most of us enjoy about them is the aesthetic value they give us. I mean, the, the, the Spartana Marsh is certainly beautiful in its own right, but to me, it becomes a lot more interesting when you have these islands scattered around in it to create some change in the landscape. 
Uh, and things a lot of people do not understand about these islands is they're incredibly rich in archaeological, cultural, and historical resources, uh, particularly when you date back three or 4,000 years ago to Native Americans. Uh, they were very nomadic, not unlike a lot of tribes in Africa and so forth, and they moved seasonally down toward the coast in the wintertime and inland in the summertime, as you might expect to get away from biting insects and so forth. But they fed uh, largely on shellfish resources when they were in the coastal area. So they left shell deposits behind, sometimes just as an artifact of, of normal feeding activities, but oftentimes in ceremonial deposits. So we have shell rings, shell, uh, shell mounds and so forth, as well as shell middens where the shell is just kind of dispersed around. Then uh, they're also very significant functionally to us as storm buffers. Not unlike the barrier islands, these back barrier islands or hammocks are actually helped to um, moderate the impacts of storm surges and winds from tropical storms. And I'm going to talk to you primarily about the ecological <coughs> attributes. So this gives you kind of an indication of what, how the funding is. Um, I really don't have any pointed funding now to be working on Hammock Islands. My supervisor, fortunately, um, allows me to do it because he agrees with me it's a very important area we still don't know enough about. So we started off in 2000, in, in, uh, 2003, 2004 with $30,000 with 30, to basically tell OCRM everything there was that you could possibly know about a Hammock Island. It's what they wanted to know. And I was uninvited to meetings after the first meeting I attended because I stood up and said, this is ridiculous, we can't determine all of this stuff. If we had $200,000, much less $30,000. They wanted to know what the difference was in the ecological characteristics of the island, depending upon the size of the island, the shape of the island, the distance of the island from the coast, whether the island was within a, a developed region of the coast, and whether the island was developed itself. And that was the one that really got me, and I, I quickly said, well, would you define to me what developed is? I said, if it's an island that's got a little fish camp on it, somebody goes to once a month or two or three times a year, is that the same as an island that's got a condo development on it, like Mariner's Cave, for instance, going out to Folly Beach? That's a hammock. I said, that's a drastic difference in development, but they're both developed in a sense. And I said, what if somebody's got no kids but 10 cats? <laughs> or no cats. What if the cats are indoor cats? What if the cats are outdoor cats? I mean, there's just so much variability, there's no way you could measure that. But we did actually look at a few islands that were touched by development, and mo those islands mostly were in the Kiowa area. So, anyway, I continue to go to islands uh, through last week. I update this program every, about every two or three weeks after I visit additional islands. So, I've now been to 182 islands. Well, that's pretty. It's a pretty dismal effort when there's four or five thousand of them. But I'm doing what I can. Uh, anyway, when we first started going to these islands, and even today, it's you have to, there's a lot of logistical concerns for going to islands. The utmost is when you go to an island, if you can get to it, if you have uh, access to it, you might stay a long time if you don't plan around the tides. <laughs> <laughs> so you must be exercise a lot of care in when you go to an island and how you get there, or you may not get back. Um, anyway, as I mentioned, we also looked at disturbed versus undisturbed types of islands. So these are the, when we started in 2003, 2004, we picked what we call the Sweet 16 Islands. These were islands, I told them that we could not do any more than 16 islands, because originally they said, well, you don't need to visit these islands but maybe you know two or three times during the course of his study and I said oh. I said the natural world's a lot more dynamic than that if you really want to have any indication of what these islands are all about they need to be visited at least once a month preferably a lot more frequently than that and, that, and this was only for an eight month period we had funding and I said really this needs to go on much longer than this I mean there's lots of variation both seasonally and even between years there's lots of variation when you do migratory species particularly so I finally talked to them to limit the 16 core islands that were visited once a month for an eight month period. So those are the islands you can see there, Folly, Kiowa region, we, we picked that as our developed region of the coast, and then the Ace Basin. So we were trying to get some indication of possible differences in how these islands function depending upon the type of human land use practices in the vicinity. 
Of the 182 islands, you'll see that's again the distribution of sizes of islands I, I have been to, and it's pretty reflective of the distribution of islands along the coastline. You'll see the vast majority of fairly small islands, and I've been, only been to a few really large islands. Another thing about this the survey is there's lots of inconsistency in the, the scope of survey and what re real effort is, is how much time you've spent on an island. Now, I've been to some islands, like I said, eight times or so. In fact, there were six of those islands I went to to complete a complete calendar year of one of monthly visits. So there's six islands I've been to at least a dozen times. But of the 182, probably 165 of those I've only been to one time. So that's, and what I find there, particularly in the world of wildlife, and most specifically birds, is very dependent upon the season of my visit. So the area of most intensive uh, survey is from Charleston, from Pauley <coughs> Beach, basically down to the Ace Basin. You, you, uh, that's where 90% of the islands I've been to, but I've been to some islands up as far north as Merle's Inlet, which is basically where our estuary systems drop out north of Merle's Inlet. You saw back in the, the table the very few hammock islands north of Merle's Inlet. Horry County has hardly any hammock islands because it's not a big estuarine system there. But then when you get down into Beaufort County, Charleston County, because it's so long, it has a very long coastline with lots of estuary, and Beaufort County, because it has so many bays and sounds, there's lots of, of islands there. So the methodology was what I coined as a foraging methodology. It's not unlike what a troop of, of chimpanzees would do to make their living. <laughs> it wasn't random, because what I wanted to do was, over time, try to record as many of the attributes of the given island as possible. So I didn't want to randomize my search. I wanted to make sure I followed different paths every time I went to an island so I could see over time as much of the surface area of that property as possible. Because if there's rare plants, if you just did, if you randomize, you might very easily overlook some very significant assets of an island. So I intentionally did it in a non-random fashion. And uh, I had to limit to some extent the type of tools I used for this or I'd have to carry a troop of people to carry all the equipment I would need. So primarily binoculars and a potato rake to roll over logs and other cover looking for amphibians and reptiles and so forth. And I'm pretty fortunate in that I'm very good at, at mimicking bird calls and calling birds so I, I, that was something else I used in my repertoire of trying to record primarily birds. So that's the effort uh, by region. Uh, and shows you by far most of them in Charleston, Kiowa, and Ace Basin. But I've spent the equivalent of about 106 eight-hour work days on islands. So I'm probably the most expert in the world on hammock islands, although, again, I consider myself as not knowing a whole lot because of just so much. I still have this great desire to go whenever I possibly can to these islands, particularly during the most dynamic seasons, which are right now. The fall season is when we have huge migrations of, but, of birds and also insects, and again in the spring. And unfortunately, those times have always coincided with the peak of other job responsibilities. <laughs> so I, I really, like a day like today, with a big tide and the wind not blowing real bad, real strongly, I was just sick that I couldn't be out on an island. <laughs> Particularly seeing them when I came in. Some of the ones I could see from the causeway coming in are ones I have not been to. So I was like, God, I wish I could have gotten that out. Uh, I did take a GPS. Uh, every time I go to an island, I carry a handheld GPS. And that's basically so I can look back and see that I've covered the island. That's particularly important when I was trying to make sure over time that I'd, that I'd wandered around and covered it. And I'd see my previous tracks on the GPS. And in, basically any time I could look on the face of the GPS and start seeing a path that I'd been to before, I would move away from that to make sure again that I was covering a, a new area. So this is a, a 600 acre island. And that's a, after a couple of trips. And you can see this is kind of my technique was to wander back and forth basically toward the middle of the island or toward the opposite side of the island and not <coughs> go back across my path. And then the outlying spots on there are what are called waypoints. That's uh, unique features that I would get latitude, longitude coordinates for to record. So if I wanted to go back and check those sites. And down near the big islands in the Ace Basin, there's isolated weapons, um, freshwater weapons typically. This is an 11 acre island after about 10 trips. So you see I get pretty good coverage after I go to a, a particularly fairly small island on numerous trips. 
Anyways, getting into results now, um, recorded at least 560 species of plants. The reason that's an at least is because if you look down at the bottom, I've got, oh, probably close to a thousand prepared plant specimens awaiting positive identification to species by university botanists. I'm a pretty good botanist as far as once I know something, I can go out in the field and I can recognize it. But if it's a species of grass or sedge that you have to look at through a microscope and go through all these real laborious plant keys to determine which species it is, that's a little bit beyond probably my abilities and certainly my time. Um, so I've got these relationships with botanists at Clemson and at the Citadel to be identifying these plants. Unfortunately, I'm not very patient, so they're not identifying quite as quickly as I would like to see it happen. Uh, so I have many, many plants that are awaiting identification. A lot of them are replicas because I collect the same unknown species over and over and over from each island I go to to get a record for that species because it may end up, some of them might be some rare species of plant. So it's very important to know all the different sites where they may occur. So most of these are grasses and sedges um, that, again, are pretty, uh, it's pretty difficult to key those things out. Um, so anyway, 22 rare or uncommon species listed in South Carolina I've documented on these islands. So very significant botanically. Very diverse. One of the reasons for this is because these islands are incredibly diverse in habitat types over a very small landscape. And that's because of the impacts or non-impacts of salt. As you move away from the edge of the salt marsh and get a buffer right around that edge and you don't get salt intruding up into the center of the island, you start getting habitats or plant communities that are more typical of very large land masses. So you have very rapid changes of plant communities or habitats as you move away from the influence of salt. So that's affected a lot by the shape of the island, the size of the island, and the proximity of the island to the coastline. Islands that are very close to the, to the ocean are obviously get more impact during tropical storms and big high tide events from salt than ones that are farther removed up in some sound or bay or, or the um, a basin, river basin, like the Edisto or Ace Basin area. So incredibly diverse. Um, some of the, the common habitats or plant communities are salt flat. Salt flats are the upper extent of the salt marsh tidal areas that only inundate during very large tide events like we're having today. There'll be flooded salt flats. They get the name because they're very flat, like a plateau in the marsh. <laughs> And they're incredibly salty because they're very flat. It's tides on big tide events that get up and inundate them, and then when the tide recedes, the water doesn't withdraw from the, tide, the, the salt flat very quickly, so it just percolates down into the sediments. And then when the sun comes out over the days that it doesn't flood, it evaporates all the fresh water out of the soil, and the salt remains. So it becomes very, very saline. So it's only a few specialized plants that can survive in these areas. And those are, those are some of the plants, salt works and glass works. Then you get up and there's a, a distinctive transition zone at, between the upland and the tidal areas. And that's what's typically called the salt shrub thicket. And it's usually a little collar around these islands and around all the salt marsh areas where you get the transition from salt marsh to upland. And it's typically just got sea oxide, which is an aster, and marsh elder are two of the more common plants there in that zone. And when you step up into the upland where you get the soils basically depleted of salt by rain events, you start getting more of the plants you would find in a typical upland, upland area in the coastal area. And it's, uh, southern red cedar is one of the ones that can actually withstand more salt than most of our trees. So it's oftentimes right around the edges of the island. Then in uh, areas where you have a, a fairly um, flat area, but it's above the high tide influence, a lot of times there's little pockets that'll hold fresh water, gets very moist, it's very lush growth, very swampy with shrubs, incredibly thick. So those are shrub swamps is what, what they're called. Excellent places for lots of types of wildlife and certainly insects like mosquitoes. <laughs> and then in areas where it's fairly poor soil and open areas with not much uh, canopy closure, you have what's called a hammock or grasslands. That sponsors species like sweetgrass, which is what the, um, the grass, and that's our native variety of sweetgrass, unlike most of it that's used in landscaping, is actually from Texas. <laughs> it's the same species, but a different variety, which is a little concerning to me because I'm a little afraid that maybe these, all of this is used in landscaping may eventually contaminate our, our real native sweetgrass population. 
Then down in the East Basin, particularly, we have, like I said, we have a lot of isolated wetlands within these islands. Very important because fresh water is essential for a huge group of animals, wildlife, like amphibians. Practically all amphibians have to have fresh water. So many more species of amphibians in the Ace Basin are on islands where there are freshwater wetlands down on islands that are surrounded by salt marsh without freshwater wetlands. Also freshwater fishes, lots of aquatic insects, a lot more diversity of dragonflies, things like that, you find where there's not fresh water nearby. And plants. So this is an aerial view of a, this is about a 30 acre island and that's about a three or four acre wetland. The entire wetland is colonized by almost a sing, one single species of plant. It's a relative of Spartana, salt marsh, uh, smooth cord grass is Spartana that's in the salt marshes. This one's called sand cord grass, <coughs> Spartana bakeri. Pretty neat plant. It probably will make its way into the landscaping industry. Very versatile, real pretty, real sprawling, kind of silvery green leaves on it. Uh, it does real well. I've got some in my brother's yard up in Clarendon County. It's doing really well. So I think it's going to probably become a good landscape plant. But the centers of these ponds often are open, not unlike the Everglades region of Florida. These openings or pools in the center many times have permanent fresh water or maintained by alligators. So the, the gators are very important for the uh, overall ecology of these, these isolated wetland systems. Now, many of the islands, even here in the Kiowa area, where there's not many freshwater wetlands as such, the, what is sponsoring species of amphibians is what I call a bowl depression. And that is formed undoubtedly by a blown down tree. Many years ago, the root ball came out and it left a depression. And what happens is it retains water during torrential rain events. And when the water starts to recede, raccoons go in and dig to try to maintain access to fresh water. And they maintain these depressions that still sponsor species of amphibians. So this island, only wetland on the island, it would never qualify as a wetland, but it's sponsoring populations of things like squirrel tree frog or southern toad. And then there's forested depression wetlands that again have uh, seasonal uh, surface water, very important for species of amphibians, also a lot of aquatic insects, particularly dragonflies. And permanent wetlands have large species of fish present. So a lot of species of amphibians and aquatic insects cannot coexist with large fishes for obvious reasons. So these seasonal wetlands are very valuable to those species of wildlife. Um, now about the Native American shell deposits. This is a shell mound. Um, you'll see the piece, the wood and aluminum around are what are called cover boards that we put out on some of the islands to try to attract reptiles, amphibians, small mammals um, as a means of, of increasing our odds of encounter. Um, so we put some around here. I did find some skinks and things under some of these cover boards right around that shell mound. Shell mounds are very significant because they, in the coastal part of South Carolina, the soil uh, pH is generally about six and a half. But on these shell mounds, the soil pH is about 12 to 14. So you go from an area where it's almost always very acidic soils to an area of very alkaline soils. So they're unique plants that occur nowhere else in the world except on Native American shell deposits. Several of the rarest plants in South Carolina and the entire southeastern United States are found only in associated with Native American shell deposits. And what makes these islands so valuable is that most of the shell deposits in larger land masses have been destroyed or at least damaged by human agricultural activities or silvicultural activities or development over the years. People, when they made out big plantation fields for Sea Island cotton or whatever, since then didn't avoid little shell mounds that were like this were only 12 or 15 feet across. They just went right through them. So most of our better um, examples of these types of things are on these isolated islands. This is an indication, this shows you a shell ring. That's about uh, 70 yards across in the center of this. Stand in the Ace Basin, uh, this DNR just got these islands, as a matter of fact, they're part of Botany Bay Plantation. The island to the right up there, it also has a shell ring attached to it. That island is about two and a half acres. It's made entirely of shell. And there's colonies of our rarest plants on those islands. So these, some of these, and one of the plants that's associated with shell sites is called shell mound buckthorn. 
Um, and it, it was thought to be incredibly rare. There weren't very many known sites of its existence in the state until I started this Hammock Island survey, and I found it all over the place, but always associated with Native American shell deposits. I can almost predict it's going to be there if I find shell deposits on an island. So it's, it's really good. I've, I've increased the uh, inventory of some of these rare plants dramatically by doing this survey. The sad part is that unfortunately the shell, shell deposits are almost always on the highest elevation area of an island because that's obviously that's where the Indians would have gone to to get away from the tide. So if somebody's going to develop an island, it's right where we want to put our houses on the highest part of the island as well. So there's several privately owned hammock islands that have wonderful shell sites on them that right now as we're sitting here have piles being driven into the shell sites and homes being or buildings being constructed. But this shows you, this, this is a shell ring, which is a ceremonial deposit, deposition of shell. They put that shell there intentionally, obviously, to make it in that ring shape. And we, we think it may have been from some like of a wedding type ceremony or something. And the shell mounds are thought to also be ceremonial, where they intentionally piled up bunches and bunches of shell. The other bigger island here has got a lot of what's called shell midden. And again, that's just where the shell just kind of broadcasts generally around the surface of the island from just feeding activity. They were wandering around different campsite every time and throwing the shell out as they fed on the, sh on the uh, oysters and clams. But all three of those types of habitats maintain some of these really rare plants that depend upon these high pH soils. And then there's evidence of sea island cotton. Amazingly how these, it's hard to really see these things well with a photograph, but that one does a pretty good job of capturing it, but it amazes me how well preserved these furrows are that are several hundred years old and there's now live oaks that are 150 years old or 200 years old growing out in the forest that are there's a closed canopy over this of live oaks it's just amazing to, to realize that 200 250 years ago that island had no trees on it it was all under sea island cotton so some of our best preserved examples of that too are on hammocks because they haven't had follow-up agriculture on top of of the sea island cotton then this is a, an example of an island that was created by the industry producing tabby. To make tabby, they burn oyster shell. So this island is nothing but oyster shell. It's got coal, actually, or chunks of charcoals impregnated throughout the whole island, where it was a place, a site, where they were burning oyster shell to create the mortar for making tabby walls and so forth back again several hundred years ago. Um, it's a pretty good size island. It's about an acre and a half, and it's got a huge colony of one of our real rare plants that likes high calcium soils. This is obviously very high in calcium because it's nothing but oyster shell. This is what these shell forest type islands look like. Incredibly lush. If I were to blindfold you, disorient you somehow time-wise too, and drop you on one of these islands, you would swear you're in the tropics. Just incredibly lush vegetation at all levels. Shell forest, there's some unusual plants this, uh, that are associated with it. The satin pearls is among our rare plants listed in the state. It's only found, again, associated with um, shell soils. Southern sugar maple occurs along some of our river bluffs in uh, limestone deposits, but otherwise it's found on islands in the coastal zone that have shell deposits on them. Then the rich soils, the other thing about the shells, it helps hold moisture. It sponsors deciduous plants. Most of our plants that naturally occur in the coastal zone are more of a maritime type forest or evergreen. So when you get these shell deposits, it attracts a lot of plants that are deciduous. They drop their leaves in the wintertime, so it helps build up the organic matter in the soil. So you get, and then that holds more moisture in the soil. So you get a whole assemblage of plants that like shell or mesic means damp. That otherwise you don't necessarily find too often in the coastal area. Then the shell mounds again, I mentioned the plants. Um, Godfrey's privet is only known from three sites in South Carolina. All of, all of those are hammock islands. It's only found with shells. And the small flower buckthorn and shell mound buckthorn is one I mentioned before that I found on many islands, just about everywhere where I find shell. Mid and prickly pear is a rare species of, of prickly pear or cactus. It's thought to be one of the earliest examples of genetic engineering by humans in the Western Hemisphere. The Native Americans we think genetically engineered a cactus to be devoid of spines for, for food. 
Then we have xeric or very dry, well-drained sandy soils that are typical of our maritime type systems, very typical here on Kiowa and on most of the Hammock Islands very near the ocean. It sponsors some, some unusual plants. They're specialized pine barren sunrose, for instance, is on the list of rare plants. It's only found in maritime forests in these real dry, open, sandy soils. Then there's wetland plants. The four-leaf vetch was only known from one site in South Carolina and Beaufort County until I started this survey, and I found it on three islands where nobody knew it occurred. So it's pretty neat. I get to see some really neat stuff. So it's been, I guess you can probably get a sense as to why, why I'm so excited about it. That's the list of the 22 species of rare plants that are listed in the state that have been found on Hammock Islands. Before we started the survey, we actually did a, a an interview survey of regional, uh, usually um, college or, or university affiliated scientists to see what they thought we would find on the islands. Well, I spent my, my whole life as sort of a naturalist, and I had never spent any time on these islands, but I've been in Charleston for many years, and I didn't really expect to see a whole lot on these islands. I thought that, you know, there wouldn't be a whole lot there. I mean, these are islands after all. They wouldn't, stuff doesn't get out on these islands very easily. Um, so. We did a, when we did the, um, the, cert, the inventories of people, we got back and figured we'd find like maybe a half dozen species of mammals, probably a half dozen species of reptiles, no amphibians, nobody thought we'd find amphibians on the islands, and I think we'd probably find oh, maybe 75 species of birds associated with the islands. So keep that in mind as we go through here. First of all, 21 species of mammals. And one thing that surprised me, and once I had talked with Jim Jordan a good bit and found out that bobcats really don't mind getting in the water that much, I wasn't quite as surprised about finding bobcats on so many islands, but they're actually on quite a lot of the islands. Um, they're actually bobcats on Folly Beach, believe it or not. Uh, quite a population of bobcats on Morris Island. But I found them even on small islands. They apparently at low tide at least don't mind moving out through the through the marshes, and I'm sure it's mainly animals that are going out to establish new territories. But deer and raccoon, of course, are pretty well ubiquitous. Then there's uh, some species of conservation concern that, that use these islands quite heavily, uh, except for the squirrels. Squirrels of any species are not likely to be encountered on islands. Uh, unless there's a causeway connection. So here at Kiowa, gray squirrels are kind of spread around on a number of the hammocks that have causeway connections either to John's Island or to the larger part of Kiowa. But when you get out to isolated islands, squirrels, I guess, just don't like to swim. <laughs> and probably don't sustain populations for long, long, long periods of time if they don't have influx of new, new animals or whatever. They probably get eaten by other animals. So they're not very abundant. Then the Ace Basin, a couple of large islands have species that have a population of eastern fox squirrel which is really significant. And if you look at the photographs, the two big islands are separated by about a 300 yard wide large tidal creek. The animals on one island are, look totally different from the animals on the other island. So I'm sure there's some genetic isolation there for hundreds of years that has got these two different populations basically. The islands are very important for certain to river otter. Um, both otter and mink, mink are so nocturnal and they light on their feet, they're very small, it's difficult to, to document the presence of mink unless you use specific types of survey techniques that we did not use. I did find tracks of mink. I've seen a couple of individual mink on islands. I found a skull of a mink on an island. The, but intuitively, I have to realize, I think these, these islands are very important to mink because they have to have den sites for giving birth to their young. They can't give birth to the young or probably don't out on, in the Spartana Marsh, almost certainly in upland areas. And certainly river uh, otter is the same way. They give birth to their young in dens. So, but they also, otters are very social. They habitually come, go to sites that are called otter latrines or otter camps that are territorial marking sites and also places where they relax, sleep, roll in the dust, and slide down the bank and have fun, play with each other. And they leave their scent marks by defecating basically. So these sites are pretty easy to find and they are all over the place on these islands. And invariably it's in sites on the islands that are away from human disturbance. If there's a little teeny creek that comes in on the back side of an island that's on a big waterway, that's where you find the, the campsite that the otters use. They don't really like being around people a whole lot when they're, when they're in their campsites particularly. I'm sure they won't have some privacy like we would too. 
Um, now, since mammals are so nocturnal and so secretive and probably more intelligent than am I, I generally found that uh, determined their presence by sign instead of actually seeing the animals. So I, I tell people I got to be a pretty good scatologist. <laughs> <laughs> but the salt flats are an excellent place to determine the presence of mammals because it's a good place to find the, the footprints because the tide will come up and wash out previous prints and you can get some nice fish, fresh prints after big tide events. So that's one of the ways I documented things like bobcat and mink. But the scat is also pretty definitive for most animals. Down in Beaufort County, particularly in Collin County now, and moving this way, non-banded armadillo. My guess is on Kiowa, people will be cursing non-banded armadillos in the next within the next two decades. They're uh, they're incredibly abundant in Beaufort County. Just about every island I go to in Beaufort County has a pretty good population of armadillos, and they burrow incessantly. <laughs> so they wouldn't be fun for backyard gardening. <laughs> Probably really good for diamondback rattlesnakes because they make burrows that can be used as den sites by rattlesnakes. Do they damage the trees? Well, yeah, they do damage to the soil. I mean, theoretically, they could, depending upon you know exactly where the burrow is. We're actually doing a little bit of a study on one of the large islands down in the Ace Basin now to try to see what kind of impact they may have on regeneration of the forest and so forth. Probably the most important aspect of these islands to wildlife is their <coughs> value to migratory songbirds. Many of us, many of you probably never see these birds. They migrate at night this time of year at elevation by the thousands. Many of our, many of our songbirds that breed in North America, north of Mexico, and winter primarily in, north, in Mexico and South America and the Caribbean islands and so forth. So they migrate through in the fall, flying for as much as eight hours at night. They drop, do what's called a dropout phenomenon right before sunrise. And what they're doing is trying to get out of sight as quickly as possible so they don't, aren't consumed by birds of prey. Not coincidentally, our small raptors that largely feed on birds, like merlin, sharp shin hawk, cooper's hawk, and peregrine falcon, migrate during the daytime at the same season. So if you're a small bird and you're out flying around during the daytime, you're likely to be consumed by a raptor. So it's very important they find habitat for one, protection, to get away from predators and also out of, the, out of the elements. They've been flying for eight hours, possibly going through rain and wind, certainly. They, and if you, they've been doing all this on stored body fats. So they've got to find a place to rest, get out of weather and away from predators and to replenish their fat reserves. So they're virtual eating machines when they come down. So they need to have all these things readily available. Well, back several hundred years ago, before we developed the coastal area so much, there was lots of these resources all over all the barrier islands and all these hammock islands. Well, now, there's not nearly as much of those resources as it was, particularly for species that like to have shrub thicket type habitat, because that's what humans don't like, is thickets. So these islands are generally very thick. If you've ever walked on one, you can attest to the fact they are. They're incredibly valuable to these birds. Remarkably, I've recovered six, recorded 60 species of these so-called Nearctic Neotropical migratory birds. Nearctic region is the Western Hemisphere north of Mexico. The Neotropical region is the Western Hemisphere south of Mexico. So that's why they can call Nearctic Neotropical, because they migrate back and forth between the two. They breed in one in winter, generally in the other. So there are about 75 species in this group that migrate down the East Coast. I've reported 60 of the 75 on Hammock Islands. And that's remarkable because I've only been to 182 islands and I've only about a tenth of that number of islands have I been to in the fall. So that's an indication of how valuable these islands certainly are to these birds. The reasons are because these islands have lots of fruit bearing shrubs as well as lots of insects, which if you, you certainly know there's lots of mosquitoes and plenty of small warblers and things will eat things the size of mosquitoes. But the resident birds you find, residents are birds that do not migrate. They basically spend their entire lives in a general area. So it's the same ones you find here on Kiowa or anywhere in the coastal part of South Carolina. These are kind of the top four that you find on just about any wooded property. The one that you might say is missing from that 
if any of you are birds, oftentimes when you see chickadees, there's another bird that hangs out with them. Titmouse. Titmouse. Yeah. For some reason, titmouse apparently does not like to, to move across open areas to the extent that chickadee does. Even a little small island, way out in the middle of nowhere, it's like two or three acres, almost always has a breeding pair of chickadees. But you hardly ever find tit mice unless the island's very close to a larger landmass. Sometimes they can be very abundant on an island that's near a larger landmass that has lots of hardwoods on it, but typically they do not occur on Hammock Island. Then some of the other breeding birds, even some of these Nearctic Neotropical migratory birds, they, they're very common breeders on islands, but they're not here in the wintertime. Uh, things like yellow-throated warbler, white Iberia, northern perula, and particularly blue-gray gnatcatcher. It likes to nest in live oaks, so it's a very common breeder in the coastal part of the state. Then the, the most glorious one of all, and it's probably the one that the islands are most valuable to, is painted bunny. Uh, you'll see when we when I did uh, the 25 islands early in the study, we found painted bunnies on 22 of 25 islands. And a couple of these islands had no habitat for painted bunnies. So pretty much after having gone to 182 islands and having been to, I've tried to go to a number of islands during the breeding season, I can tell you that there's about a 98% possibility that if you go to an island that's three acres or larger that has a forest on it, it will have at least a breeding pair of painted bunnies. And those, ch those odds are increased if you're in the Charleston Kiowa area versus the Ace Basin. You see on one, uh, one 34 acre hammock up near Charleston, DNR was banding bunnings and still is. They banned some bunnings at several places here on Kiowa. We banded 42 bunnings in one summer on one island. Now many of them were young birds, but there were at least 10, well we had 13 what are called AS after second year males. The males do not get all the gaudy plumage until they're after their second birthday. So the younger males are still green colored, kind of a little bit brighter than the average female bunny. So we had 13 after second year males on that island. So incredibly good habitat for painted bunnies. Then in the winter, we have another whole suite of birds that moves in from the far north that breed up in Canada and alpine type regions in the northern United States that move south in the winter. And these are our typical winter birds and that's still the same things you would find here in, on Kiowa, these same, same birds. Then particularly in the Ace Basin, there's a lot of wetland birds. Um, seaside sparrow is one that's in the salt marsh. In fact, it nests primarily in black needle rush marsh. Um, there's a little island just north of the northeast of the causeway coming in here that's got quite a lot of black needle rush actually up on the island. Um, I went to it with Carrie and Norm. Mike, did you go that day? I uh, went to it one day by kayak and it and we saw like 33 seaside sparrows on that one little island that's only a couple of acres. So um, it's a species of highest conservation concern in South Carolina and throughout the southeast, just like painted bunny. So very significant find. Then there's all the nocturnal birds you'd find along in the whole coastal part of the state use these islands. In fact, barn owl is another species of highest conservation concern. I've found it on a number of islands roosting underneath the dead palmetto fronds. <laughs> then of course there's bald eagle. You guys certainly should realize that bald eagles nest on hammocks. There's a pair of bald eagles that have been moving around between several hammocks down on the southwest end of Kiowa for the last eight or ten years. Originally they were nesting right by the entrance. Okay. Then they moved to Snake Island and they left Snake Island and went to a little island that's not named that I recently named it Airy, Airy Islet because it's a small island and it, had, it used to have an eagle airy on it. And now they moved from it to Andel Island. I don't know whether they're going to nest on Andel Island or not, but they started building a nest on Andel Island uh, last spring. Have you seen them? They're on Andel? So they are there? So they are they add into the nest because the nest wasn't completed. Yeah, they've taken away almost everything from the Snake Island nest. Taken away. Good. Let's hope they're successful. Don't know for sure why they left Snake Island, but yeah. somewhere about the time they left Snake Island, it was a bridge built from Mandel Island to Snake Island. But I've I've seen eagle nest on oh, about a half dozen hammocks. 
distributed along the coast. And I think there's 16 non-eagle nesting territories on Hammock Islands along the coast. Um, another incredibly valuable aspect of these islands is their value to wading birds. Um, not as much for breeding sites as for resting and roosting sites. If you today, if you were observing, if you were riding out here, or anytime you're riding in and out of here at high tide on particularly really big tides, the marsh gets so deep that even our largest wading birds, like great eagles and great blue herons, can't wade. So they spend that time resting and they typically will recruit to these hammock islands or some forest border near the marsh where they don't get a lot of disturbance from people. Wading birds are typically pretty wary. So it's pretty predictable if you see an island that's way out isolated, if you look at it on high tide from a distance, you'll see it's just peppered with white birds because that's the ones that stand out the most. So we record, recorded uh, 11 species of wading birds on islands, including wood stork. In fact, I saw 36 wood storks on, a, on about a 10 acre hammock island down in, over on the Tubadoo Creek area week before last at high tide. Um, so very important for these birds. If you walk around these islands, one thing you'll notice is the white wash or droppings from wading birds just all over the place around the edge of these islands, particularly underneath dead pine trees and things where they roost. But, Incredibly valuable, and several species picked down at Ace Basin, again, where it is enclosed wetlands, there's, there's some rookeries or communal nesting sites for wading birds. Green heron is one, is one that nests on a lot of the hammock islands because it doesn't usually occur in these, necessarily in these big rookery type situations. But 10 of those 11 species, the only, only species I've found associated with hammocks is not a priority conservation species in the state and region, is cattle eater. But all the, the other 10 are high priority or um, conservation species, meaning their populations are in, are in decline, and certainly the wood store. Then I told you that we were, it was predicted we found about uh, half a dozen species of reptiles. Well, 23 so far. These are the small reptiles you're most likely to encounter. Carolina knoll is on practically every island. And then the most frequently encountered snakes, uh, and if you look at the body style of these snakes, they're very long, streamlined snakes. They swim very well, and that's probably one of the reasons they're found on more islands than a lot of the other types of snakes. Plus, they're kind of uh, very diverse in their food habits and not specialized, like things like hognose snakes. You wouldn't expect necessarily to find on hammock islands because they feed mostly on toads, and amphibians are not very common on islands. Then uh, down in the Ace Basin, Fortunately, there's a good number of venomous snakes, which I think is pretty cool. Um, Eastern diamondback is even still fairly abundant down in the Ace Basin, and I was fortunate enough to encounter them on uh, three different hammock islands. This big girl here is about five and a half feet long. I had two guys walking with me that day, and I saw the snake. It was in a live oak type maritime forest, and I saw the snake about two and a half feet away from me, just sprawled out. She was basking in the sun. And I, the guys, like, they always walk right straight behind me. Most people that go with me don't wander out too far. the <laughs> snake. So anyway, they followed me, and we got about four or five feet on the other side of the snake. And I said, "Y'all see that?" And they said, "What?" I said, about a five and a half foot diamondback rattlesnake right there. And they said, "You teasing me?" And so I looked at her and to her. But the snake was so laid back, it was incredible. She didn't want to go anywhere. Where do you say she? Too big for a male. And the the pit vipers, the the females are. The maximum size is almost twice the size of the male. The male. So if you get a six or seven foot long down back rattlesnake, it's, it's almost certainly a female. You'd have some at Bear Island. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. In fact, there's still, I mean, there's, I think Norm told me there's been a record or two on Kiwa in the last 15, 10, 15 years or so. So they, they show up in places where they're not certainly common. Uh, diamondbacks swim very well. So that's one of the reasons they disperse and distribute to these islands down in the Ace Basin. Uh, there was actually a record, a legitimate record of a diamond back up in the Francis Marion National Forest just a week or two ago. So fortunately, there's still some around. Um, and I know most people don't like snakes at all and certainly not venomous snakes, but I had to actually force this snake to get into a nice posture for me to take a picture. <laughs> I mean, you can't show somebody a picture of a rattlesnake that's not coiled. She did not want to coil. She never rattled. And I, she tried to crawl off as soon as she knew she was made. 
you know, they don't hear, snakes don't hear, they just feel vibrations. So I, she finally started crawling off trying to go in a hollow palmetto log and I kept dragging her out with my, with my um, potato rake. And I, finally, and I finally, every time she'd go, I'd tap in front of her and she finally coiled up so I could get a picture of her. <laughs> But she would, they are not always heard. They were really laid back, and the ones I've seen are that way. In fact, you know, even cottonmouths are not really aggressive. They get kind of a bad rap. The thing is about them, they're designed to have this belief that they're camouflaged and nobody sees me if I just sit here. <laughs> so they, they're very stubborn. They don't want to move because obviously once they move, they know they've been had. So that's, that's one of the things about these snakes that makes people think they're kind of, they're aggressive. And they're kind of like the little guy on the block the smaller ones are more aggressive than the big ones, so that's why diamondbacks are really laid back. Not many things are going to mess with them, so they don't have any reason to be aggressive. But some of the islands down in the Ace Basin are, have big populations of cotton now, particularly the ones with the wetlands, and even the one with the shell forest photograph I had before, it's got a big population of cotton mouths on, even though it doesn't have any wetlands other than those little bowl depressions. But it's got a big population of rodents and skinks that the uh, cotton mouths are using for food. But then again, now when we have these freshwater wetlands, we have a number of species of, of wetland-type reptiles. Lots of alligators in the ace basin on these islands with freshwater ponds. Another very important thing that's difficult to prove, except on a few islands, I've found uh, diamondback terrapin nests on a number of the hammock islands and several here around Kiowa where I've found terrapin nests. Sad thing about it is, uh, I know several people who do a lot of research on terrapins, and no one has found, yet found a terrapin nest unless it had been excavated by a predator. Uh, they're very good at, at hiding their nest. So the only islands that I know their nest on are the ones where a raccoon probably has consumed the eggs. But my guess is, is since these islands are in the salt marsh, in close proximity to where the terrapins hang out and they have nice sandy soils which are not perfect for nesting, they're probably incredibly valuable as nesting sites, particularly since all of the other surrounding areas or most of the other surrounding areas in some areas are under development. Um, most remarkably, 11 species of amphibians. Now, here in the Key Charleston, Kiwa area, I think we found four species of amphibians so far in Charleston, Kiwa area. And those are Southern toad, southern leopard frog, narrow mouth toad, and squirrel tree frog. Well, no five, green tree frog as well. Uh, squirrel tree frog is the one you're most likely to encounter because they have a very short tadpole stage. And also narrow mouth toad has a, has a short tadpole, uh, tadpole stage. In fact, found narrow mouth toad on Snake Island, which is very, very un on you. And in the Ace Basin, three species of salamanders. Uh, number of species of fishes, that's a pretty poor slide, but nine, nine species of fishes, several of them totally freshwater fishes that are in these isolated wetlands. Uh, I've got a lot of interest in some geneticists wanting to do some research to see if these things are actually distinct from other populations. Obviously, they're very isolated in a freshwater pond surrounded by salt water. <coughs> I don't see black bass there. Nope. Why? Large mouth bass? Small, either one. Um, small or large. Well, we don't have small mouth here. They just stop up in the upper part of the state. But large mouth bass has to have permanent water. It needs pretty good size water bodies because they're a large predatory species. So none of these wetlands are large enough to, to sustain a population of a large predatory type fish. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of an entomologist, I'm very interested in insects and the species that I can most readily identify in the field or, or in the butterfly group and the dragonfly group. So every survey I've been on, I've recorded butterflies and dragonflies. In the coastal zone of South Carolina, there are about 120 species of butterflies. So again, this is an indication of how diverse these islands are. I've found over half of those species on hammock islands. Um, this one actually is one that's considered to be rare in the state and I actually found it to be very common on some of the islands and the reason is because this little plant that specializes in brackish soils around the outside of islands is fairly common on islands 
and it's thought to be one of the original larval host plants for this butterfly. But on the mainland, it, its larvae feed primarily on a, on a weed that's not native. So that may be why it's not very commonly seen by most butterfly people because they don't go out on islands. And this is one that's one of our um, indications of changes in climate along the southeast coast. This is a sort of a tropical species of butterfly that 25 years ago was not found here. And now we have a sustaining population in the coastal zone, generally associated with these islands. Because the islands have a lot of this larval host plant going around right at the transition from upland down to the salt marsh in that kind of salt shrub type area. This, this is a, a vine variety in the milkweed family. It's the larval host of this butterfly. And then the monarch butterfly that migrates south in the fall, these, uh, they come through the coastal zone just like the migratory birds. Most of the migra migrations occur right along the slopes of the mountains and right along the coastline because of the changes in temperature that create upwellings or drought or uh, updrafts in the atmosphere that help keep them uh, aloft without a whole lot of effort. So these are, that's our major migration corridors right along the mountains and right along the coastline. So that's true with monarch butterflies as well. So it just so happens, it doesn't just so happen, I'm sure it's part of the whole evolutionary process. The coastal area is very rich in a species of plant that's in the aster family that happen to have a higher bang for the buck in the nectar than most groups of plants. But this ground cell tree, or eastern baccarus, which is blooming right now, if you look along the causeway when you go out of here, you'll see this stuff is just covered with butterflies. And the monarchs are just starting to get here. My prediction is by next week, those, those plants will be enveloped with migratory monarch butterflies. So they, not unlike birds, are using stored body fats during their migration so they can need to have resources available when they're coming through to get nectar. So if you're interested in the long-term health of the monarch butterfly, which not too many humans probably are, then you should be concerned about deforestation, particularly the loss of shrub thicket type areas on the, in the coastal zone because it supports a major food plant for monarch butterflies when they're migrating through. It's also very valuable, lots of birds, because lots of insects go to that plant. So the birds come and eat all the flies and smaller insects that are, that are going to those flowers. Uh, 21 species of dragonflies, and the one up in the top left, sure, sure some of you have heard of Rudy Mankey, oh, yeah. one of the worldwide recognized naturalists. Well, one of his passions is dragonflies, and I know Rudy pretty well. I've been out in the field with him a couple times, so. Um, this dragonfly, the found darner, I talked to Rudy about dragonflies, and this one had only been one ever found in South Carolina. So I saw what I thought were found darners on a couple of islands, four different islands, Long Island here in the Charleston area, and several islands down in the East Basin have these, these forested seasonal wetlands. And he said, Billy, I you know, usually believe everything you tell me about things you said you've seen, but this time we have to call you bluff. He said, unless you catch one of these things and send it to me, I'm not going to believe you. So I was out one. I don't typically carry a butterfly net with me. I do in my car, but not frequently on the islands because I got too many other things going on. So this day I ha didn't have a net, but I got it on the island really early in the morning, and it was in October, which is when I've usually seen those things about this time of year. And it was I saw this dragonfly roosting on the underside of a branch. So I actually was able to catch it with my hand, and it was one of these found darners. <laughs> so I actually kept it and sent it to him. And like a day after he got to Columbia, he called me and said, Billy, I apologize. You have found an So that's one of the coolest things I've found. And I, quite, I saw like nine or ten of them in one day on one of these islands around this particular well. So pretty cool. And the roseate skimmer is just like the queen butterfly. It's a tropical insect that now is common here along the coast. Very common on Kiwa, Keeping an eye out. Are they pretty much just insectivores? Yeah. Then there's thousands probably of other species of them. In fact, the Atlantic grasshopper in the lower left is probably the primary prey item for breeding painted bunnies. Um, I see the females and the males repeatedly diving down into the salt shrub thicket area, which is where these grasshoppers are very, very abundant, grabbing these grasshoppers and taking them back either to their mate, in the case of the males, in case I've seen them feeling them feeding their mates, or the females taking them back to their hungry youngsters. And then when the youngsters are fledged, you'll see whole family, families of bunnies foraging out in the salt shrub thickets uh, 
primarily on this species of grasshopper just because it's a good size for bunnings and it's also incredibly abundant. So anyway, the total diversity, this is the six islands I surveyed during a 12-month period. Three in the Ace Basin, three in the Charleston Kiowa region. So this gives you a little bit of indication of the difference between a developed region versus an undeveloped region. And there's explanations for why, obviously. In a developed area, you don't have nearly as many mammals as you do in an undeveloped area. Same thing with reptiles. Um, the bird one is kind of interesting. I think the reason there's more species of birds on associated islands in the Charleston Kiowa area is because there's less habitat other than islands. So the, the islands kind of become more important as places that are undisturbed, particularly again for species that like real thick shrub areas. Uh, this shows that. This is uh, an assemblage of shrub thicket oriented birds that breed and carry out most of their lives when they're here in shrub thickets, including painted bunny, but particularly so for eastern towhee and brown thrasher. These birds apparently do not like to go to islands. In the Ace Basin, there's tons of shrub thickets all over the place. Why would you want to fly across open salt marsh to go to an island when you can get everything you need without doing it? But in the Charleston area, most of the islands I go to around Folly Beach, for instance, have towhees on them. But I go to the Ace Basin, there's only about two or three islands out of 90-something I've been to in the Ace Basin, I've found even a single towhee. So you look at the, the population, basically, this is number of birds encountered per survey hour. Just incredible difference, particularly for towhee and brown thrasher in the two different areas. So they're basically, again, I think, being forced to go to islands in this area to find the kind of habitat they need. But even painted bunny, slightly more abundant in the Charleston area than in the Ace Basin. And this is also shown in the, in the winter sparrows, that some of the birds that recruit here to spend the winter that don't breed here, that like shrub thickets. So the same thing is shown with them, how they're much more abundant on the islands here than they are in the Ace Basin. Uh, we have problems with invasive species on islands, just like everywhere now. Um, our landscaping industry has brought us lots of great plants, but unfortunately the ones that really do well are capable of surviving in the wild. So they've managed to get, on, even on the islands, and it's particularly through the ones that are very appealing to wildlife. One that birds love, they spread the seeds all over the place. So tallow tree is, tallow tree is the worst invasive species we have in the coastal part of the southeast, without a doubt. It actually eventually destroys wetlands. It doesn't like to be in standing water, it likes to be very close to it in damp soil. So what happens, most of our wetland plants like open wetlands. So what happens is it creates a canopy. It, it kills off the plants under it from out competing them. It also uses up the water because the trees get really big and have lots of water use. And then as it uses the water, it invades farther toward the center of the wetland where it's been dewatered. So that over time, depending on the depth of the wetland, if you've got a fairly shallow wetland, over maybe 50 years or a century, that wetland will be completely enveloped in nothing but tallow tree. And we can see that on some of the islands down in the Ace Basin. Um, is that the same as the uh, kudzu? No, sir. This is Chinese tallow tree popcorn tree. Kudzu is a vine. This is a this is a tree. Uh, so this is an, this is an indication of one of those wetlands I'm talking about. It, it ha I know it was one time an open wetland because there's still a few relic button bush plants in it that are almost dead, but still putting out sprouts and trying to survive real tall shoots trying to get up to the sunlight. But other than that, there's nothing on the forest floor hardly at all because of so many tallow trees. So I've uh, spent lots of time and effort and a good bit of money trying to eradicate tallow tree on a 400 acre island. Not an easy thing to do. Because I found out one of the downsides to killing the trees is you have a huge germination rate of seeds that have been laying in the substrate. And it's predicted that tallow tree seeds can survive in the forest floor for over for up to 100 years. So once you get rid of the adult trees, it sponsors, if more sunlight gets in, so you have a huge burst of germination of seeds that are laying in the, in the sediments. So some of these wetlands now that, you, that I looked at that were wide open when I went and killed the tallow trees, they now have tallow trees that are thick as a lawn, up about two feet tall. We also have feral animals. Um, a lot of 
humans, again, don't like shrub thickets. So if you don't like shrub thickets, put goat. <coughs> This shows you what goats will do to a forest. This should be a nice thick forest with a real healthy shrub undergrowth type area. The goats ate everything that was within six feet of the ground. Can't you put the goats where the tallow trees are? <laughs> Sadly, they don't just go to tallow trees. They actually are a little bit shy of wetlands. They don't like mud on their feet. Goats are pretty picky. <laughs> That's one of the reasons they're real well suited for putting on islands, because they won't leave them. But they'll eat everything in sight. They also don't like wetlands because of alligators. <laughs> but, they, but they seriously will not walk in mud. This is a, this, these islands are right across that same creek I mentioned about fox squirrels. The islands, the topography and everything is exactly the same. But the one with the goats, this is what it looks like. This is what the one on the other side where there are no goats. And we have invasive insects. Certainly we have fire ants or getting on the islands, unfortunately. That's one of the problems, again, when humans develop an island. They take lots of pests with them. Uh, and things of like in, uh, insects or in potted plants or whatever. Another thing that most people aren't aware of is we have a, a South American moth whose larvae eat cacti. They were brought in with, with uh, landscaping cactus, and now they're out killing our native cacti, including the rare one, the midden prickly pear. It's very widespread in the Ace Basin in populations of this rare cactus. So this is the overall diversity of uh, species, plants, again, about 560 birds, 21. I mean, uh, mammals, 21 birds, 164 species, and people thought we'd find maybe 50 to 75. So it, when I get out this time of year, I still have a decent chance of recording a new species of bird with these migratory birds that are coming through, but unfortunately, again, I don't get out that often. I went to an island last week when I had decent weather and decent tides, and I recorded about 25 species on this one island of these Neoarctic Neotropical birds. None of them were new species, though, but there were some that weren't very common that I, that I saw that day. So always exciting to get out this time of year, as I said before. Uh, 58 species are listed in the state as conservation priority species. So obviously very valuable. These are some of the factors on um, location, obviously relative to regional develop development, as I pointed out, is a very important factor of what you might find on the islands. The distance from the larger land masses obviously affects the recruitment of species. Whether it's accessible to people or not, particularly for wading birds, things. If people frequent a place, they don't frequent it. Size of the island is important, again, relative to heights impacted by salt. Same thing with shape. Um, we did find that there is a general increase in diversity of both plants and animals as the island size increases. So typically, if there's a five acre island and a 25 acre island, the 25 acre island is going to be much more diverse. But it, the slope starts to kind of level off as you get up, you know, bigger and bigger islands, because obviously there's not an inexhaustible number of potential species. But the shape of the island is very important because a very long, narrow, relic dune ridge doesn't have a lot of buffering from salt influence. So it won't be as diverse in habitats as one that's broader. Wetlands are obviously a very important factor. So that's kind of the thing, some of the things I just mentioned to you. These are some of the, the high points likely critical for painted bunting. Uh, also, undoubtedly very important to diamondback terrapin, though it's difficult to prove that again because the nests are so difficult to find. Uh, very important to a number of mammals, including some of our uh, high value mammals like otter mink and also bobcat. One of the uh, DNR, like all of the states and U.S. territories, was tasked by the federal government to come up with what's called a comprehensive wildlife conservation strategy, which is basically supposed to be a blueprint for the next at least 10 years. It's supposed to be updated every, updated every 10 years for our wildlife management. The reason this uh, grant was given to all the states and territories was, was to try to preempt listing of species under the Endangered Species Act, because once a species makes it on the endangered list, it's a huge financial burden to the federal government. So we did that in 2005. So those 58 species I was talking about, those are ones that are in that plan as being priority conservation species. So theoretically, those are the species we're supposed to concentrate on managing. 
um, for the next 10 years and then revisit that and update the plan. But that's all dependent upon, obviously, funds. So this grant didn't give us enough funds to really put the plan into action. It allowed us to develop the plan. So anyway, we did identify a community species. The weakness in it was that um, throughout the process, this is another project that I was recruited on to, um, I kept saying, you know, there's a lot of difference in minks in the salt marsh and minks on Edisto River and otters in the salt marsh and otters on the Edisto River or bobcats on Keogh Island versus bobcats in Oconee County. Almost certainly, we're now in the age where we know there are a lot of different races or genetic differences in species that have different pressures on them. So I kept making a point that we should have things like coastal, speed, coastal populations of bobcats should be listed in this plan and coastal populations of otters. They're very different when you grow up in a salt marsh than growing up in a freshwater wetland. Um, I didn't make it very far, but I, I kept pushing that. Um, but I still am very, I, I'm very convinced that these species, these animals in the, in the lower coastal area are probably different genetically from ones that are inland and not isolated. Uh, the value of these islands is going to increase as time goes on, there's no doubt, because the predicted population increase in the coastal zone of South Carolina in the next 20 years is another million people. Where are they going to go? Um, on, on that, unfortunately, our planning for how to concentrate development has not improved a whole lot, because everybody wants to be have a nice you know, place where they're not crammed in with everybody else. So they are, these islands are at a premium under the development microscope. So anyway, uh, there's lots of things. I mean, like I told you, this, this project, even though I've been to 182 islands, it's actually pretty limited. I mean, there's so much more I would like to be able to find out about these islands. Particularly these migratory birds, again, that are here today and gone tomorrow. I can go to an island and see, I went to Long Island one day, one of the islands in Long Island, and saw like 250 of these birds just boiling in the canopy. They'd just come down. I got there very early in the morning. And it was very frustrating for me because I wanted to identify everything that was there. But it was just incredible. The, the forest was alive with birds. Well, I could go back there this fall and not see that because they don't know where they're coming down. So it's incredibly dynamic migration. It's different every day. It's different every year on the same day. So it's very difficult to capture that as the you know, exact significance of it. So obviously the best option is to protect them all, but that's obviously not very realistic. Definitely need to try to come up with some kind of best management practice for these places that are developed. We're trying to do that uh, with DNR now, but it's a very difficult thing to do because unfortunately though, many of us and collectively biologists and scientists have been studying wildlife populations for hundreds of years. We still don't know enough about habitat requirements. And it's very complicated when you've got migratory species their, their, their habitat requirements are tremendously diverse. So you take out any part of it and you're doing possibly irreparable damage to that population of wildlife, but we, we can't specify exactly what they need. Do you need a 50-foot buffer or will a 30-foot buffer work? We don't, there's no way to know. You can't, you can't do that. There's, you probably could never collect enough data on painted bunny, for instance, to say exactly what the buffer width would need to be on an island or a barrier island to protect the long-term integrity of the population of painted bunnies. One of the things I'm really interested in is trying to protect these shell sites, because again, we're never going to have another three or four thousand year old Native American shell deposit. <laughs> and most of them do not qualify for federal protection or state protection. So it's, it's quite sad that we're losing these things again every day, really. There's a good chance there's some of these things that are disappearing that nobody even knows they're there. Why don't they qualify? That according to the, the federal um, national historic, whatever it is, to be on that register, they have to have, to have certain types of artifacts associated with them. I mean, it's pretty sad. They're not significant to us unless there's some kind of artifacts there other than just the shell. Right. Then you have to dig all around it, which is, you know, disturbing the integrity of the site just to do an evaluation. Well, I think they should just be protected because they, again, they, they, they're just for the fact that they're 3,000 year old shell sites, they're valuable, historically and culturally and all that, but also botanically particularly, they, you know, they have at least the potential to have these rare plants. 
I mean, if these rare plant populations are going to expand, they've got to have that microhabitat available. So if you're destroying them in a fashion, you're eliminating the potential survival of those species of plants that are associated with them. So anyway, what does the future hold? That's an open question at this point. Um, you'll see that we've done a pretty good job trying to protect some regions of the South Carolina coast by having protected places, particularly in Cape Romaine area and East Basin, through purchases by federal and state government or by conservation easements. But you'll notice this pretty major problem. We have lots of migratory species and also wildlife, plants, and animals need a continuum of habitat. Well, let's suppose we had a Katrina episode that happened to come in with the epicenter of the storm surge in one of these spots. There's nothing protected in between them. And like I said, in the central Charleston County area is arguably one of our most valuable parts of the coastline for some of these species of wildlife that are associated with these islands because they're more abundant on the islands there than they are even in the Ace Basin. So we need to start protecting some of these places in these large gaps. You can't, it's, it's a perfect example of putting all your eggs in one basket when you're trying to protect all your resources in just a few areas when you need to actually have a continuum of habitat so things can actually move and react to disturbances in one area by having things outside of it. That's the way wildlife populations work, is there's natural disasters, storms, fires, and all that kind of stuff, but there's always some of the population on the outside of where that area was so they can recruit back in if the habitat changes. We're setting things up. Protection's great, but in some ways, we're setting ourselves up for long-term failure by potential uh, catastrophic events. So I use Long Island as an example. It's in the, the heart of Charleston County. Um, it's also been in the news a lot. It also is undeveloped at this point. It's 300 or so acres of forest. This is a 25 square mile area photo. And this is 2004. So now about half of the forest is, that was on James Island and Folly Beach that was in this photo is no longer there. So. It's by far the largest expanse of forested habitat in that part of Charleston County. And it's also very strategic. And you see the, sh the shoreline shifts very dramatically right there at Lighthouse Inlet. So when these birds are coming down the coastline, they are naturally intercepted by Long Island. That happens to be the island where I found the highest diversity of these migratory birds, 36 species, I think, yeah. That gives you an indication of how these birds come down and they fall out. So if they fall out in all that open marshland north of there, they're going to naturally recruit to, to Long Island. So it's probably one of our most valuable um, unprotected areas along the coastline because of its size and its orientation and its, and its location. Surrounded by developed areas. And even the little teeny area that's like 75 acres on the north end of Folly that's now protected, called Lighthouse in the Preserve. There's been 62 species out of these about 75 recorded there. Actually, you make it 63 now because I recorded Western Canada there a couple of weeks ago. Um, but you can just imagine how much more valuable Long Island probably is when it's, or it's 10 times larger than this little place on the end of the poly. Um, there were regulations passed in 2006 to try to, um, that was what all this started about, was to try to get information to come up with more meaningful regulations for bridges to islands. Um, at that time, there were about 2,400 islands that were not protected uh, by being under conservation easement or being owned by the state or federal government. It, most, many of those could have theoretically had bridges to them. Well, after the, per after the regulations were passed in 2006, there are now only about 140 islands that would qualify for bridge permits. Um, that's really good, but the regulations were unfortunately compromised when they went through the legislature. This process was organized in a fashion so we had representatives from all different sides got together on a panel to come up with a compromise proposed regulation package. Well, when it went to Columbia, it was further compromised. And not on the side of natural resource conservation. So there was a number of safeguards in the legislation, the, the proposed legislation for protecting wetlands, for buffers, for not using uh, non-native plants and landscaping, all that kind of stuff. All of that was stricken from the um, bill before it 
emerged. But it did become law and it did protect most of the islands from a bridge permit. The problem is, if you go to an island without putting a bridge to it, you can do virtually whatever you want to. And this is Long Island today. And this is exactly where I saw 250 birds boiling in the woods. Well, most of the woods are gone because the owner decided to have somebody go in and get rid of the shrub tickets because he didn't like shrub tickets. He wanted me to drive his little golf cart around on the island. Happened to be a number of those shrubs were a rare species of plant. He needed no permit to do this. Uh, this is an ongoing construction project on a little hammock in central Charleston County that no permit was received for driving across the marsh. In fact, they put dirt across the marsh so they could drive across the marsh to build a house. Strangely enough, they got a permit from DHEC to put in a septic tank. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm going to start at the northeast part of Kiowa. I'll real quickly go through these are the islands I've, I've been to around Kiowa. So most of them, again, I've taken the liberty to name them just because I couldn't easily find a name for them. But that's Bass Creek. So there's a, there's a hammock on Bass Creek that I named Bass Creek Island. And there's Eagle Point. That one now has a large home on it. One of the neatest islands I've been to of the 182, actually, that island. Just incredible island. Very nice old relic sand dunes, some of the highest relic sand dunes of any I've seen. And then the island has got the roadway all the way across it. Originally named it Lunch Island because Norm Shea and his group and I sat down on the grass there one day and ate lunch. <laughs> but it was the first place I found a sign of Bobcat, so I went back and named it Bobcat Hammond. <coughs> so that's the east, east part. And when you get over to the mouth of the Kiwa River on the Stone Oak, most of the islands actually go on the north or west side of the, of the Kiowa group of islands there around Chaplin Creek. And then you come down. Um, Beck Island, which is the uh, one that's um, protected by the Conservancy. That's a nice island. It's actually got a little shell mound on it. A little shell set on it with one of those rare plants, the shell mound buckthorns on that island. It's got a pair of penny bunnies on it. It's got an otter camp on it. It's used by diamondback terrapins. So it's, even though it's only about a two and a half acre island, very high diversity on that little island. Um, this little salt palmetto islet, as I named it, I just went to that about a month and a half ago. It's right out from Marsh Island Park, which we also surveyed. Um, interestingly, I found a painted bunny on that island, a pair of painted bunnies. The male had band, bands, had the four color bands on him. I was able to get his trust enough, or the pair's trust enough, I sat there within about 35 feet of him for about 10 or 15 minutes, watched him catch a praying mantid and bring it to her. And he kept flying down, feeding and stuff, and I was able to get a perfect identification of all of his different bands. And so I sent the information in and found out he'd been banded in 2007, right at a home just back inland of Marsh Island Park. So that likely was where he was he and his mate were nesting in 2007. It was on that little island. There's also an, there's an otter camp on that little island where that creek comes right up next, abuts the island. Uh, that's a neat little island. It's got lots of salt palmetto on it. And that's coming down uh, the Bryan's Creek area across from Rhett's Bluff. Again, we went out to that, uh, the one that's called Al, that I call Al Islet. The reason I went to that island originally was to try to track down a painted bunny that had a transmitter on it that had been abandoned at Jim Chipwood's house. And the girl that's doing the research on the nesting habitat had lost that bird, never could get to it because she thought it might have been all the way over on John's Island. I said, well, I'll bring a canoe over one day and we'll go out there and try to find it. So we went over and went right straight to him. He was perched up in a dead tree. And there was a great horned owl on the island that was right back behind where he was. So that's why I named it Owl Island. Um, Anyway, it had, we were able to see him and his mate. And there was another male, another beautiful male, was sparring with him the whole time. He was real protective of his mate, so that was pretty cool. So that's where that bird's nesting, one of your birds. And I went back to uh, the, a couple of the other islands a little bit later and saw a banded male on one of the other birds, what other ones, but I wasn't able to get a complete 
Uh, the one is one named Terrapin. Isn't that the one, Terry, where we saw the bunny? Couldn't really get a real good look at his legs, but I think I got his colors. But I don't, he's he big, probably came from your, probably one of your birds. This is um, this is the islands just to the north and east of the parkway, Mango Point. We did both sides of Mango, Mango Point. We surveyed the northeast side and the southwest side as uh, undeveloped island versus a developed island. Pretty interesting. The, the plant diversity is generally increased when you have some amount of human development, but not a whole lot, because you bring in landscaping plants and <coughs> waste and weeds and any kind of field dirt and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was that was pretty interesting to look compare those two sides. And we did the little marsh hawk island, which is out off one of the golf courses, and a little shrike hammock, as I named it, because it had a loggerhead shrike on it, which is a bird of conservation concern. That's the one where I had so, we found so many uh, seaside sparrows on that little island. It's also an otter, an otter camp on that island. They're not good to have here. This is the islands uh, on the south and west side of the Colorway. Also, good to Quinty's Island, which is over on the edge of Cohegan. Anyway, a lot of people think, and I've taken a long time, so I'll take questions.